Hey, hey, it's KXP, live at home, joined by one of my favorite MCs from the city of Philadelphia, Ms. Ivy Soul is here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. Yo, I'm so excited that we got to host you. Do um, you want to talk about this performance? Sure. You're about to share with us? For sure. Song? Um, so this is my KXP debut. Really excited about it. Um, I'm coming to you live from the Paul Robeson House and Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And the first song that we start with is Name It. KXP, live at home with Ivy Soul. My name is Ivy Soul. 
performing here live from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the Paul Robeson House and Museum. That last track was called Name It from my most recent EP called Southpaw. And this next one's an oldie from Overgrown. It's called Roller Coaster. Thanks. year. It's produced by Lee Clark featuring Kingsley Ibanechi and it's my baby. <laughs> Thank you. 
have to love me back You know that I'm dangerous Lord knows I do me back Don't have to love me back You know that I'm dangerous Lord knows I do me back uh. I heard that it ain't love unless you say so Like you got Cupid on your payroll But I got Oshun, Oshun on my hotline Ready for you when you got time And if it sounds like worse or worst case I'm a sinner Seeking redemption in the haze of your glimmer Hope the next lifetime your soul will remember That I did right by you But color me bad brain Full crate, follow me up with a fast chase Prostrate, praying for touch in a bad way Bashment, brucking your wine, it's a fast break Castrate, know it's a lie with your match back Matchstick, splitting some wine, seen the ashtray Covered in the dust and I tried to relax, wait You never love me but you tried You always felt the safest and the softest goodbye uh. Don't have to love me back You know that I'm dangerous Lord knows I do me bad Don't have to love me back You know that I'm dangerous Lord knows I do me bad Yeah And yup, yup, too far now I'm too ahead of you, uh, yeah I'm like beyond it, yup, I'm too far now You think you found me, whoa That's astounding, yup, I'm too far now Ahead of you, uh, yeah I'm like beyond it, yup, I'm too far now You think you found me, whoa, 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 whoa. I'll never change my touch I've been so stuck in my way Hardly evading love Like to see the one who shows me Meanings of the core One who knows that life is fixed with Pain and truth and more I just hope to see it I just want to take this time to thank Paul Robeson House for allowing us in here. It has been the pleasure of my life to be able to inhabit the space of one of my personal heroes. And I also want to give a shout out to the heroes around me. Got Cam Cephas on, on the drums, Kayla Childs on the key bass, Max Honig on the keys, and Larry Live Nation, AKA Larry Monroe Jr., AKA Guitar God, 
on the electric guitar. Um, this next song is by an artist that's really special to me. His name is Sir, and this is called John Redcorn. Like I said, we're at the Paul Robeson House and Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Paul Robeson once said that the artist must take sides. He must elect to fight for freedom or for slavery. He made his choice. He had no alternative. Now we have to make our choice for ourselves. This last song is called Heavy. The past year has been incredibly heavy for so many people for so many reasons. And I'm indebted to the people who came before me 
to not only use my life, but also my art for freedom. Thank you.
Well, damn. <laughs> yo, thank you so much for that performance. Uh, yo, you just ended with one of my favorite songs off the Southpaw EP, Heavy. Um, man, I got to tell you, when I heard that song, like you have a couple songs that you've released through the years that have had me just like hit repeat. I heard Heavy and I had to listen to it like five times in a row. Uh, can you talk about that song, like just the process of like writing it? Sure. Um, I think this past year for most of us has been pretty heavy. 2020 illuminated a lot of the tragedy that is our country. And that's where I was. Um, I've been in Brooklyn. So I've been, I moved to Brooklyn Mm -hmm. not too long before the pandemic um, started. I know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And just been like in my house, the, the quarantine and the shelter in place really did change a lot for me, like individually, uh, but also collectively. And I actually um, shelved a project so I could focus on making art that would get me through, (laughs) through the quarantine. And Heavy was one of those joints. Heavy... Um, it's got this beautiful sample that I actually copped off Spice, uh, Splice, which is a, a really dope platform. Uh-huh. Yeah, and is that the one that um, Ninth Wonder has something to do with? I be- maybe I wouldn't be surprised. Ninth is everywhere. Um, <laughs> like I remember watching an interview with Ninth Wonder and Bob James, and they were talking about sampling. Mm. It's a new platform where people could get samples. And like Bob James' whole library is there. I did I don't know see if that. It's the same one. I did see that. Okay. Uh, that um, interview. It was such a sick interview. Um, <laughs> it was, yeah. But yeah, I just like, so I, I've just been being as intentional and as uh, vulnerable with myself and with the music as possible over the past year or so. Um, And I feel like I've always done that, but I just feel like I'm articulating myself better nowadays. Yeah, super clear, super on point to the heart. You know, Um, I see I I have to notice the boxing gloves and the the painting behind you and the whole Southpaw EP. Is this is this a new uh, a new thing you picked up? The gloves like are are you a boxer now? So (laughs) it's like a new thing and an old thing. I feel like a lot of my life is a is a circle. And I like fall out of love or fall out of practice with things and then like return to them. So um, when I was growing up, my my stepdad was an avid boxer and boxing match viewer. So like that's where I learned to fight, <laughs> literally. Um, so like I during quarantine, I couldn't get to the gym, couldn't do a lot of the things that I usually do to move my body. So I started picking up the gloves again. <laughs> Yeah, that's what's up. What uh, I used to live in Brooklyn too. So Word. personally, I'm just curious. Like, what neighborhood are you in right now? <laughs> oh, I'm in Best Star. Um, oh, I'm you're in Best Star. Yeah. Um, okay. And it's beautiful. I love Best Star. Reminds me a lot of or Brooklyn as a whole, but Best Star specifically reminds me a lot of Philly, and I feel like that's why I, <laughs> I'm enjoying it so much. Definitely, it's it's a lot more laid back than Manhattan for sure. When I lived in when I lived in New York, it's funny. I used to go to Philly just to escape New York because it was more chill, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's like Brooklyn has calmed down a lot, and I know it's gonna it's gonna be up there again um, because folks are getting vaccinated, folks are excited to be outside. But I'm probably still gonna be on some low key shit, honestly. Yeah. What uh, what brought on the move to New York and how have you been surviving this pandemic? Like, have you been able to work or what, what's it been like? So the, the move to New York was to be closer to um, like my support system, uh, be it my manager, Ethan. Um, most of my collaborators uh, had relocated to New York or were always in New York. Um, and just, yeah, it felt like I can always go back to Philly because more or less that's home. So to go and try something new felt right. Uh, The timing was a little meh because, you know, um, I think I got, I think I got like almost a year in before um, the pandemic hit. 
But the issue is that like, I was gone a lot. Like I was doing a lot of shows and not really being able to be in the city and feel what the city was, was offering me. Um, but yeah, like Brooklyn, I mean, you know, Brooklyn artist hand in hand. Um, yeah. As far as um, how I'm surviving, I actually have been extremely, extremely, extremely fortunate to receive a, a Facebook grant. Um, oh, wow. I want to be clear. It's still fuck Facebook for <laughs> the purposes of <laughs> of their uh, influence on our politics and just like how much data and shit that they're. It's just that's a lot. However, I do appreciate the fact that they have made a concerted effort in recent times to fix those things as well as support artists and creators online. So I, that really has been a game changer for me. Otherwise, you know, I've been thugging it out on unemployment and hey, there you go, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> racking up the the um, streaming money like everybody else for real, for real. Like yeah, well, it's it's different for everybody. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. Especially like when I think of New York, I think of the cost of living, and it's for sure. just <laughs> for sure. the only reason. The re- only reason I didn't stay there back in the day was the cost of living at that time. Now we're at a place where Seattle and New York are kind of close, but yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm also yeah. I'm fortunate for a lot of things. I've been able to um, navigate the finances of being an indie musician in a way that a lot of people don't have the opportunity or the option to do. I've always been able to have like a very slim, but a a rainy day fund that exists. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a little bit of a cushion, then Mm -hmm. started getting unemployment and yeah, just been plugging it out. Yeah. I love it. Um, you did a new song during this set, and I have so many questions about the new album. But before we get to that, since this is the first time I'm interviewing you, I gotta I gotta go uh, pe- to the past a little bit, if that's all right. That's cool. Um, you know, I, I I've never done this before, but I brought an album with me. Oh you know, wow! The, bless the up, bless, bless, album bless. was one of my, was one of my favorite albums that year. Um, I read that you went to Germany to record this record. I did. I did. In, in two weeks. Can you talk about that process? Because sure. that's fascinating to me <laughs> that you went to another country <laughs> and then got it all in in two weeks. You know, that's amazing. I I often question my motives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this amazing artist, German artist named Crow, C-R-O, he hit me up the summer before Overgrown dropped. And he asked me to come to Germany to help him finish his album. And I, I was like, huh? Like, I can't afford to go to Germany. He was like, oh, no, no, no. Like, you bring you and a friend or you and your manager and we'll take care of all of that. So I go. I have an amazing time. It's just a week. But, like, I get to see his space, his studio like the way that he works and i was like i wonder if he would let me come out here and record my album because like that'd be Mm, dope mm -hmm. so yeah i asked and he was like of course like just tell me what dates you need and we'll do it that way um i'll bring in session musicians if you want session musicians you can bring whoever you'd like so i was able to save up enough money from my day job back then to bring um me, Ethan, uh, Corey Smith West of Bathe, and then Cam DeLa, this amazing producer out of South Jersey. Yeah, and then we just cooked for two weeks straight, nonstop, like no breaks, and Overgrown is what came out of it. Had you um, written slash produced material that ended up on the album before you got there? No, sir. No, wow. sir. Wow, it was all there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's such a I mean, like you said, your music is very personal, but this album in particular is like you you went in, you know. Thank it's you. it's it's a it's a healing body of work. Is it do you feel like it's something about the the distance of just being in another part of the world that like helped you kind of go inward? To a certain extent, I, I think I'm I'm not a person 
I'm not a, an artist or writer that is a write every single day type artist. Um, I like much respect to the, those who are able to kind of pull it out of themselves every day. But really, I'm, I'm more of a person that is sitting with my thoughts and my feelings and processing them and processing them. And then I'm able to express them in a way that I feel like is artistic and like, yeah, I just need, I need time to actually say what I want to say. And I think that I was just (laughs) at that point, I hadn't been writing much at all. So it was just pen to pad Mm -hmm. as soon as I got there. So in some ways, yes, going to Germany definitely helped like, like the, the unknown of it, but there was also a level of comfort to it because it's some, it's a place that I felt comfortable before. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, one of my favorite songs on here is um, Achilles, which is a brilliant title for the song as well, Thank you. I must say. Thank you. Um, and I guess this is more of a personal question than a question about music, but I don't even think it's in the lyrics. I think it's just you talking at the end of the song where you talk about, um, it's not my fault what happened to me, but it's my responsibility to heal. That just you saying that on the song meant a lot to me. And, you know, we talk a lot about um, here on KXP as music being healing. But for a lot of people, you know, we all go through traumas and we all go through different kinds of traumas, but not everybody gets to that place of healing and recognizing that, um, that it's not our fault. You know what I mean? But we do have to do the work to heal. What is it in your personal life that got you to that place to even know that to say that was it therapy was it like what was it it's a combination of things first and foremost I think that the community that I have around me is one that requires accountability um queer black people and like just like the precarity that we find ourselves in requires that we hold each other to a higher standard than other people might hold their their communities to be completely frank. Um, so I'm I'm thinking of, you know, my Philly queer fam, whether that be Angel Edwards or Kai Davis or Miriam or Fufu or like all these people who really made me see that like absolutely you can have your pain, you can have your trauma, but like once you start sending that trauma and sending that pain out into the world from you. That's that's not like that's not cool. Um, and then, of course, uh, therapy has been outstanding. Uh, and I think so. Name it is the song that starts the um, the KXP set. And part of what the process of going through therapy has been for me is just learning to name things for what they are rather than for what I feel they are. Um, Mm -hmm. So being able to name depression or name anxiety or in like the macro, being able to name capitalism or being able to name anti-blackness, like those things Mm -hmm. have been transformative because it's no longer me experiencing the world as an individual. It's me experiencing the world as a being that's being... (laughs) being come at on all sides. Um, and as soon as I was able to name it, I, something in my brain clicked and I was able to, to express that, like, oh, like, I got some work to do. Like, honestly, just like, if I, if I want the love that I feel that I'm capable of giving, if I want the um, community that I, I feel like I'm capable of cultivating, if I want to make the music that I want to make, it's necessary for me to do this inner work. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You, you, you talking about naming it um, actually reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from James Baldwin. It's not one that's written down. It's, it's from an interview uh, that I was watching where uh, he was asked why he writes. And he said uh, he writes to describe mm-hmm. because if he can describe uh, what, whatever's going on, it becomes either easier to outwit, easier to overcome, but you can't get there until you can accurately describe it, you know? Thanks. And 
And yeah, you do that really well. That's something that that comes across really well in your music. Thank so you. I thank you for that. And, and I think like as artists, right, like we have, we're able to help other people name things sometimes that maybe they're going through that they haven't taken that time to name. And maybe that's one of the ways that music can be healing. Yeah. So I also just think yeah. that like specificity is such a powerful tool. I feel like what's what makes pop music special is the fact that it has no specificity right like the fact that in most ways anybody could sing the song and it would still be the same song but i think on the flip side when you have jazz r&b hip-hop electronic like all of the things that like pop takes from and like takes the grit off of like all of that music, all of that, like pure unadulterated energy music, in my opinion, uh, it's specific as fuck. Like it's Mm. so specific and only in that specificity, do you find the universality of it? Like I have no idea what Saba was going through when he was listening to, I mean, when he was making care for me because I don't like, I haven't lost who like the Walt in my life. And I'm very thankful for that. But like, I have lost people that I care about deeply. So when he's speaking about, well, I can a hundred percent feel his pain. I can feel all the things that he was expressing in his music. And I think that it's because it was so specific. Yeah, that's real. That's real. I, I've always wondered, like, through the years of listening to you, it's been a few years now, like, who are who are some of your biggest inspirations in lyricism? It could be in music or outside. The biggest inspirations in lyricism, I think I'm an R&B head more than I am a hip-hop head, to be completely frank. Like, I love, obviously, I love hip-hop, but <laughs> um, as far as pens go, I think Kalayla has a fantastic pen. Um, Moses Sumney has a fantastic pen. And what a voice too. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. I'm also really lucky to have people in my immediate space, my friends and my collaborators who I've been flabbergasted by (laughs) since we first started making music. So um, Devin Hobdy of Bathe, this duo out of Brooklyn. Um, Kingsley Ibanechi, who is this, like, he's literally an angel. (laughs) He's just a freaking angel. Um, And uh, who else would I say? Uh, Tiffany Goucher out of LA. Yeah, all of their pens are like, mm, like (laughs) giving you, giving you what you need and very, like very heartfelt, very smooth very vulnerable, very honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, were there any inspirations or a better question, I guess, would be what was it for you that initially brought you to making music? Um, <laughs> two things. First, I saw Mac Miller's Nikes on my feet. And I was like, man, if this if this white boy can do it, I can definitely do it. <laughs> um, as like a 15, 16 year old, not knowing nearly how, what I know now mm-hmm. about how much dedication and how much um, how much of a gift Matt was really to to music and to the culture. And then the second thing is um, I, I had written poetry throughout my adolescence and uh, Def Jam poetry was huge uh, when I was coming up. So the like the Commons and the Kanye's of the world, even the DMX's of the world, used to pop up at Def Jam. And I was like, oh, if this if this is like the same thing, if like really it's just laying like poetry over like beautiful instrumentation, then like why wouldn't I like why wouldn't I try at least like I don't know if I was hell-bent on like becoming an artist but I was like oh like at at the very least I need to experiment 
with this with this art form. That's awesome. I was I was reading a little bit more about your background today, which I hadn't done before. I knew I was going to interview you. What? Um, and uh, I read three three different names of different crews you were a part of um, that I did not know about. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Your group background? Yeah. Um, honestly, which one? Like which which one? I don't remember at the moment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, um, like yeah. So coming up in crews, I guess. Yeah. You know? uh, I guess the first crew technically would be Third Eye Optics. It's like so, I was born in. Uh huh. That was one of them. Yeah, I was born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, which is something that not a lot of people know. But also because Philly is where my musical birth in a lot of ways happened. So like, I'm always a, gonna be a Philly artist uh, to me anyway. Uh, <laughs> anywho, Third Eye Optics was a collective that was honestly before its time uh it consisted of miles harris who is currently a producer with uh michael made it uh brio Ankh, who is still uh releasing amazing music right now makeda the iroquois like it's just like a whole group of friends who were pursuing spiritual enlightenment more than we were music but like allowing music and art, whether it be film or uh, DJing and just like all of those, it, it felt like a a blog era, like a truly blog era, yeah. a moment that we were having in yeah. high school. We were endeavoring to be the cool kids or active or, you know what I'm saying? Like that's the energy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I heard you reference both those crews on Overgrown too. Yeah, those are, those are, yeah. yeah like, <laughs> thank you, thank you to Pac Did, thank you to Cool Kids, thank you to Overdose, Dom Kennedy, um, freaking Rhapsody. Hey. Um, yeah, they really, they really soundtracked my, my adult, like my teenage years for sure. Oh, and Love of it. course, Blue and Exile. Um, Love it. And then yeah. in college, I started like a rap group, more or less, called Liberal Arts, like. <laughs> Like the most corny uh -huh. shit ever. Um, <laughs> and we re released an EP on SoundCloud, like just just trying to get our feet wet, just trying to um, get into the mode of making music for people, for other people's consumption. <laughs> um, and then the last group that I was in right before I dropped Eden, it's called Indigold. Um, it was a trio, uh, two vocalists, me and Devin actually, and then Corey. Uh, they now make a bathe and um, yeah, we dropped one EP. It did pretty well on SoundCloud actually, but we just like, they moved to New York, like right after school. I stayed in Philly because I was terrified of being broke. And because <laughs> <laughs> Philly was a place, Philly, Philly, just like, I love it. It, it is my home. Um, Word. And that just, it felt important for me to stay. Um, yeah. So yeah, like those are the three groups groups that I was in, and yeah. I'm glad I asked that question because now I got some uh, some old school digging to do on SoundCloud Ooh. that I didn't know about. So yeah. thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, during the performance, I was excited because you did a new song from a new project, and uh, you said it's coming this year. Can you talk a bit about the about the the album? For sure. And this, uh, this, this uh, podcast you got coming with it as well. Absolutely. So um, the, the song that you heard that's called Dangerous, it is written and arranged by me, produced by Lee Clark, featuring Kingsley Ibanechi. Um It's definitely a labor of love, and it's definitely out of left. Like, it's left of center, and probably not what most people are expecting to hear from me. Um, but I think that once you hear it, you'll understand why, like I made the decisions that I made. Um, the album, I'm not going to say the, the title of the album just yet, but it's coming on a full length album. It'll be my sophomore project. So hopefully no sophomore slump. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's a 14 track album. Um, it's got 
a couple features on it, but mostly it's going to be me talking that heart shit like usual and talking that life shit and um, trying to think. Where'd you, where'd you, where'd you record this time? Oh, did, you, did you do another two weeks in Germany? <laughs> nah, <laughs> so this is the project. This project has been recorded for, like it was recorded like a year and a half ago, actually. Um, okay. So these are the songs that, us. yeah, it's new to y'all, but we've been sitting with yeah. this music for a good, good chunk of time. Because we didn't want to release mm-hmm. it during the first part of the pandemic because we didn't want for sure it to you get to lost. It. That absolutely. Yeah. But also just because yeah. I didn't think it, it I didn't want it to soundtrack that moment for sure. Like I wanted it to soundtrack a different moment because it didn't feel like Yeah, I, I just felt twenty twenty was like devastating and I didn't think that I was going to be able to lift the mood at all. Like there are moments on the album that are sad or melancholy and paired with 2020, I honestly thought it would be too much. <laughs> <laughs> Word. So, um, yeah. So in addition to the album, we're doing a narrative podcast. So it'll be eight episodes of eight to 10 minute, um, or eight to 10 minute episodes and eight episodes in total. And it'll be the story of the album. It'll just be vignettes of like the album's story arc as a whole. And yeah, it's been, it's been a really cool experience. It's my first time writing a script like this. Um, I, I wrote a couple scripts, but none specifically for audio, which has been a really yeah. uh, challenging what are the other thing. scripts for? Um, so funny enough, I actually like really wanted to be in like uh, a screenwriter when I was younger. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I was 18. There's time to do it all. For sure. Um, I, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm thinking more so that like mm-hmm. it wouldn't like three or four years ago, I wouldn't have thought to say, oh, yeah, like initially I wanted to be a filmmaker because it didn't feel real to me. But as an 18 year old, I I went to Penn um, undergrad and I actually completely disregarded like the freshman requirements (laughs) and didn't take calculus. Uh, I didn't take our writing seminar. I actually took a poetry class and, Uh (laughs) and uh, video one, which is like the initial editing uh-huh. and documentary uh, film class. Nice. And like thinking back, I'm like, yo, like teenage me audacious, like teenage me knew what they wanted. Just, it took some time for me to like re reclaim that part of myself. But yeah, I, I, I love, I love film. I love editing. I love like how edits and how coloring and, all these different like small things end up making some of the most transformative films and video content that you can imagine. What are some of your favorite films, films or filmmakers? Films and filmmakers. Ooh. Um, right now I've been like really focused on DPs rather than directors. Um, yeah. Because uh-huh. they low key be making, making the film. Uh, mm-hmm. So Arthur Jaffa is a huge, Mm -hmm. huge, huge inspiration for me. His first film was actually Daughters of the Dust, which is this like... Fire. Yeah, like that's wild. And his like second or third film was Crooklyn. So like... Yeah, wow. He's really going off. Both beautiful, uh, just just important films. Yeah. Julie Dash, right? Julie Dash. Yeah, I mean, and that combination... Another another legend. Yeah, and that combination was like... Chef's Kiss. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think. Uh, who else have I been watching? I love a Wes Anderson film. There's like obviously some um, iffiness because of how he casts his films, but like the actual craft of the film itself is pretty undeniable to me. Um, And, oh, 
there's like this excellent, excellent film on Criterion Channel right now. Um, it's called Sole O. Okay. I don't know. Um, I'm going to look it up. It's by this director called uh, Med Hondo. Super fire. Oh. Super, super fire. Okay. And recently, the movies that I love, The Farewell, was excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And anything Barry Jenkins touches is pretty great. Barry Jenkins. Terrence Nance. Yes. Terrence, Terrence Nance. Nance. Yeah. That man, that's <laughs> a bad man. That's a real bad yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I just be watching all the all the shits. I love it. I love it, man. How old are you right now? I'm sorry to ask that question. Oh no, it's I'm cool. I literally just had a birthday, so like I'm I'm like pretty like in my body and feeling my age right now. So I'm 28. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the age she was, but Ava DuVernay mm. was in her was it 30s, late 30s, the I first think time so. she picked up a first time she picked up a. a a camera. A lot of people don't know she started as an MC. She was a, she was an MC from the crew called Figures of Speech, at the Good Life Cafe. I uh, had no idea. Yeah, West Coast legend. She's like on Abstract Rude's first album. I knew of her as an MC back in the day. Wow. You know? Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. I'm gonna have to go tap film, into the discography. Yeah, the first film that she made was a documentary called This Is the Life about. Um, about the Good Life Cafe, about the hip hop community that she grew up in. So she was telling her own community story out the gate, you know what I mean? And uh, that's how I became aware of Ava, how I met Ava. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this just, just just a little something to tell you that you know, don't don't let don't let don't let any dreams die. There's time to do it all, Thanks. you know, because because I would love to see. I would love to listen to Ivy Soul's music for the rest of my life, but I would also like to see Ivy Soul films. That would be incredible. You, you know, know I mean? um, I'm trying to get my <laughs> I'm trying to get my chops up. I directed the Dangerous mm-hmm. video that's dropping nice. in a couple weeks. Um, but I'd also love to know what like dreams that you'd like to make come true before we all kick <laughs> the bucket. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Was that a question for me? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What say it one more time? You were I saying that like there are no I, dreams. Uh, it's not too late for us to like hit any dreams. Are there any dreams that you're trying to? Yeah, trying to get accomplished. This is, pro- this is probably the first time on KXP somebody's asking me a direct question while I was interviewing them. <laughs> it threw threw me off. <laughs> oh man, uh, I got books I want to write. You Ooh. know what I mean? I got books I want to write. Um, that's one of the big ones. Well, I'm trying yeah, to read your document. books. I'm definitely trying to hey, read the books. Love it, love it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's the first one that comes comes up. I want to live in a couple of different countries. That's another big one, you know. True. Yeah. I, which is that? Is that one of your goals as well? I was listening to another interview of yours that you you were talking about wanting to live in Europe. Uh, that is no longer the case. <laughs> That's no because you, you've been there. You've been there now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that there's a romanticization of Europe Mm -hmm. um, that Mm -hmm. happens, especially with black folks in America. Um, Mm -hmm. Be it because James Baldwin hyped Paris or because it just feels like there is no place worse than here sometimes. Um, It's how it feels. Yeah. Yeah. But (laughs) I'm slowly but surely realizing that until like this world transforms that like being here is not only like, what's necessary it's also like kind of a a blessed obligation like it's like my um i have a spirit spiritual connection to this land and a, a spiritual connection to making sure that this land is returned to its rightful owners as well as uh that my people are returned to to our land for sure so yeah, I mean, unless it's it's either here or like Ghana, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, like any of those places. But like for the most part, I'm just gonna be chilling on Lenape land until Lenape land or the Lenape people tell me to dip. To be honest, yeah, say that, say that. I love it. Um, that's real talk. Is there? Is there? I feel like we've covered so much. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Is there is there anything else you want people to know about you, your music, what's coming up soon? 
For sure. I would love people to follow me on socials, not for the obvious reasons of keeping up with um, what I'm doing, but also because I am sharing a lot of folks that I love and care about. Um, And I think that the only thing that is more impressive than my music is the music of my homies, (laughs) to be honest. Um, So you can definitely follow me at I-V-Y-S-O-L-E. That's on all platforms. Um, But also keep supporting KEXP. Keep supporting all these independent radio stations, these independent bookstores, these independent record stores, um, independent venues. The most powerful thing that we can do um, both as artists and consumers of music is like putting our money and our politics in the places that like affirm us. And the people Absolutely. that have always affirmed me are the KXPs and the band camps. And mm. I just got to, I got to show love where it's due. Hey, it means so much. And yo, I agree with you, especially just on that note of building community and um, yeah, it, it space is so important in, in supporting those places and those people that support community and help us build community or everything. So right. thank thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for, thank you for your time and your music and can't wait to do it in person. You can have the whole band in this room. Just remembered another question I wanted to ask oh, you. Oh, for sure. I'm just going to do it, even though yeah, I was about yeah. to wrap up the interview. <laughs> uh, because I know that you make beats and uh, yeah, I haven't heard anyone ask you directly like about, your process of making beats and how your work as a producer has influenced the way you work with uh, live instrumentation now. Dope. So I have always produced. I just never felt confident, comfortable, or the idea that I had in my head, I couldn't execute to the level that I wanted to. And in recent times, the most important thing that I like the, mo- the most important thing that I've developed is like an ear and a little bit of audacity and also some like really tangible skills. So I took a, a workshop, an engineering workshop um, last summer with 343 Labs, this amazing professor named Abe Duque. Um, and there is no right way to do something. And I know that people say that all the time, but to a certain extent, like you're thinking, Hey, like I'm not doing this correctly. Therefore it sounds bad. And Abe was like, no, you got to trust your ear. You need to trust your ear. You need to trust your taste and you need to trust your ability. So throughout last summer, I've been leaning into that just leaning into trusting the sample cut that I like chops that I want and trusting the snare and the kick that I choose and, and then doing the necessary um, mixing and engineering afterwards. But really and truly it's just, do you like it? Does it accomplish what it want, like what you want it to accomplish? If the answer to those questions is yes. Keep going. That's what I've been doing. I, I've been trying not to overthink anything. And to be honest, when I like start hitting a wall, I send it to someone else. Like I just send it off, like send it to Ethan. I send it to Corey. I send it to Lee. And I'm like, yo, I don't know what to do with this. Can you do something? And then that's Do they do something or or sometimes is it just feedback, like suggestions? I'm always about that collaboration life. I'm okay. not, yeah. I'm not worried about the splits. I'm not worried about the, mm. the credits. I'm mm-hmm. not worried. I'm, if you want to be in the liner notes, let me know. Like, I do not care. Like, I want I want music that is going to raise the hairs on my my arms when I get it back from the engineer. Like, I want I want to be surprised at where you went with it. You know what I mean? Um, so, for example, name it. Name it was <laughs> name. It was almost not on the EP because I was like, I can't I can't figure out what to do with this. I can't figure out how to make this go somewhere like I like it was very very stagnant sent it to Ethan Ethan adds the drums that most of the drums 
and like the synth pads that you hear at the end of Name It, and then it, it's it's a whole new song, completely transforms it. So um, yeah, on on the production tip, it's really just trusting my instincts and knowing when to send it off for other people's ears. That's it. Yeah. I'm so even though I was about to end the interview, I'm really glad I got that question in because, you know, growing up in hip hop, uh, there's always been a stigma, not a stigma, but a thing about like not as many women on the mic. But in all actuality, there's way more women on the mic than there are women making beats, producing, engineering. And I'm not a producer in that way. So I I've never known exactly what it is that stops more women from producing, but I feel like the more we get stories out like yours, hopefully it'll inspire more women to, you know, get on the paths, get on the beats and and just help us grow as a community. For sure. And if you are a woman uh, Mm -hmm. of trans identity or otherwise or a non-binary person, there is an amazing camp that's completely free. Uh, It happens two or three times a year. It's called In Session. Um, And I would heavily, heavily, heavily like recommend that you get involved. Like it's really, it's just a bunch of workshops giving you the toolkit that you need in order to start making your own stuff. Say that. Thank you so much. Ivy Soul live on KEXP at home for the first and not the last time. Can't wait to see you in the studio, you know? I can't wait to pull up. Seattle is, Seattle is always love. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Say that. Thank you. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.